What if I told you that our understanding of the Big Bang Theory and the very origins of our universe can be traced back to a map of pink and blue blobs? The same blurry map that Stephen Hawking described as, quote, the most important discovery of the century, if not all time. Well, today we have the privilege of hearing from astrophysicist and Nobel laureate John Mather, one of the great minds behind the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, which produced those very pink and blue blobs, also widely considered to be the first strong evidence for the Big Bang, or in the words of the Nobel Committee, the starting point for cosmology as a precision science. Our map showed pink and blue blobs uh, across the entire sky. It's very blurry, but it was mm -hmm. enough to say the early universe was not the same everywhere. There were hot and cold spots. That matters to us because if the universe had been completely exactly uniform, gravity wouldn't know what to do. It would not have any way to pull material back together again. Okay. To stop the expansion locally and make galaxies and stars and planets and people. This video is also the first of a three-part series exploring the secrets of space, many of which we're still uncovering. And it's part of a longer conversation where I had the pleasure of sitting down with John at the Aspen Ideas Festival. So listen in as we hear how John went from a dairy farm to a failed thesis project to being the first NASA scientist to win a Nobel Prize. We also cover the ongoing challenge of unifying gravity and quantum mechanics, John's time as the lead project scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope, which by the way, I'm sure you recognize imagery from, and just how much of our universe we have left to understand. As a reminder, the content here is for informational purposes only. It should not be taken as legal, business, tax, or investment advice, or be used to evaluate any investment or security, and is not directed at any investors or potential investors in any A16Z fund. For more details, please see a16z.com slash disclosures. about when you started getting involved well, in this. I got this. interested uh, pretty young. Yeah. Uh, I think I was about six years old. Wow. Uh, I heard from my dad at bedtime story time that uh, living things are made out of cells with chromosomes. Mm -hmm. And this was before we even knew about the double helix. So, okay, oh, that's well, right. that got my attention. Uh, my friends and neighbors were farmers. The, w my dad was studying dairy cows. Wow. Uh, for his research uh, for Rutgers University. And so... Uh, that was where I got started. Yeah. Uh, li living out on the farm, thinking about deep things like that, the origin of everything. Well, if you know about cells and chromosomes, then immediately you understand evolution mm -hmm. and the huge changes that can happen through time. Uh, I think I was about eight. We went to see the Museum of Natural History in New York and the planetarium show and the giant meteorite sitting there as big as a mm, small apartment, just sitting there. You say, where does that come from? Where do we yeah. come from, where, right? And where do we come from? So you see the bones arranged and showing evolutionary order in the museum. Oh, my golly, what a fascinating story. I want to know everything about this. Yes, yes. And we didn't know that much about space at that time. Maybe I'm getting a little too ahead of myself because I'm sure there's so many years between what you're describing and when you won your Nobel Prize. But that did seem like maybe the start of a new era of our understanding of space. And so could you speak a little more to the satellite that you had developed with yeah, your partner sure. and, and what that really meant as maybe an inflection point? So uh, back in 1970, I was in graduate school at the University of California, Berkeley, looking for a thesis project because I was tired of studying in the library and maybe I better build something. <laughs> so... Um, the people had just discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation. Okay. It is thought to be the remnant of the early universe. The hot Big Bang mm -hmm. still fills the universe. And so uh, can a graduate student do something to go measure it better? So the answer is yes, we'll try something. So, okay, well, I worked on a, a project which was an instrument to measure the spectrum which is to say, how bright is this radiation at each different wavelength? Yep. And we built it and we sent it up uh, attached to a high-altitude balloon. And it went up and it did not work. Oh, man, what do I do now? <laughs> so my thesis advisor said, okay, well, you did good work. Uh, you can write this up. You can make a thesis out of it. They've already published some other papers. Uh, so I said, mm, okay, I'll get a job. I got a job for NASA. Five years before that, we had just landed on the moon for the first time. Wow, okay. So, okay, 1974, I'm at NASA Laboratory in New York City. 
And, uh, okay, so NASA puts out this announcement of opportunity uh, calling for new satellite missions for science. Because what are we going to do after the moon landings are done? Maybe do something else. So, okay, so, okay, boss, my thesis project failed. We should try it in outer space. So I had no idea how much nerve was required to, to do this, so we just did it. Mm -hmm. uh, we wrote a little thin proposal. We said we have an idea. So after a couple of years, NASA said, well, we think it's a good idea. I went, and I got a job at the big NASA laboratory in Greenbelt, Maryland, just outside Washington. And they gave us some engineering time to work with people who knew how to build stuff in space. And, well, in 1989, it went up. It did. And it worked. And within weeks, we had... Um, measured the spectrum. The, my thesis project that had failed under, as a balloon payload now worked beautifully in outer space. That's incredible. And I showed a graph to the Astronomy Society, and we got a standing ovation for a graph. And so they knew what it meant. They knew basically that not only was the equipment working, but the story of the hot Big Bang was basically right. Uh, people don't remember now that there used to be alternate theories that said, yeah. well, maybe it wasn't so. A couple of years after that first announcement, we were able to say we made a map of this cosmic heat. And we, our map showed pink and blue blobs uh, across the entire sky. And what they show is if you could see millimeter waves with your eyes, you would see this big fuzzy map. It's very blurry, but it was mm -hmm. enough to say the early universe was not the same everywhere. There were hot and cold spots. And we, that matters to us because if the universe had been completely exactly uniform, um, Gravity wouldn't know what to do. It would not have any way to pull material back together again. Okay. To stop the expansion locally and make galaxies and stars and planets and people. Mm -hmm. So we're here because of those spots. And so that's pretty revolutionary. It used to be people looked at this amazing universe and thought it requires um, divine intervention because it's too dang complicated. Nobody could possibly see how it could work. We confuse, I don't know how it works, yes. or I don't know how to do it, mm -hmm. with it can't be done or it's impossible. When it comes back to how did we get here, um, it used to be we couldn't understand how to calculate anything. So yes. we figured it must be impossible. It must require divine intervention. And now I think we have a different picture. Yeah. Let me divert into that a little bit because uh, how is it that nature spontaneously produces complicated stuff? Yeah. So... There are reasons, there are real uh, fundamental deep reasons why nature produces complicated stuff. Mm -hmm. So when you think of nature as just full of atoms and ran atoms are just little billiard balls and they have no shapes and no properties, then of course how it would be extremely unusual for them to stick together and form what they do. But quantum mechanics says uh, no atoms are not little billiard balls. They have uh, shapes. Mm -hmm. they may, and they have, they're like little covered with Velcro of different flavors. So atoms stick together in certain patterns. That's how nature is. So, okay, then also we learned about thermodynamics, which tells us which kinds of reactions uh, are favored by nature. Yes. So if energy is released when two atoms come together, then it's likely to happen. Mm -hmm. So now we say, okay, it's not completely without pattern. Uh, nature gives patterns because of quantum mechanics and thermodynamics. So it's just built in that complicated things will occur given a chance. Yeah. So, okay, then what complicated things have occurred? Uh, well, there's another feature here, which uh, is that the universe, the universe spontaneously heats up. Um, mm. This is something they don't teach you in school. Uh, in school, they say, well, nature does not have two objects just sit there at the same temperature and one gets hot and one gets cold. Mm -hmm. That's true in normal life. But gravity is an exception to that. Uh, gravity is the reason why the universe has heated itself up. Right. Uh, gravity can stop the expansion of the material of the Big Bang and pull it back in to make stars. Then when it does that, the stars can light up and release nuclear energy. And now we have a state of the universe where it's hot some places and cold other places. So energy flows from place to place. Mm -hmm. And this is then the basis of the complexity that we now have. Yeah. And that's partially what we got from you're saying this image, because if this wasn't the case, if you're saying gravity didn't exist and create these local changes, then what would we see? Would we instead have seen just a clean image? Yeah. If gravity could not have acted on those hot and cold spots, those dense and less dense regions, then nothing would have happened. It would just have been a completely featureless expanding mm -hmm. universe. Uh, with no stars, no galaxies, no anythings. 
Yeah. All the same temperature. Completely boring as far as we're concerned. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. But nature does have gravity. Nature does have the other three forces of physics. And it does have quantum mechanics and, gra and uh, thermodynamics. And so it is a universe in which complexity naturally appears. Yeah. And maybe you could just speak to kind of what a phase change, again, this was in our understanding, because I think even Stephen Hawking said this maybe was one of the most important images to come through science. Why was this such an important discovery? Stephen Hawking looked at our map of the pink and blue blobs, and he said yeah. it was the most important scientific discovery of the century, there if you not go. of all time. And I first thought, oh, Stephen, you're just exaggerating. <laughs> uh, but it's very nice. And then I thought, okay, well, in truth, uh, if we could understand where those spots come from, it would tell us perhaps about the unification of the forces of nature. Right now, we still have the great mystery of quantum mechanics doesn't seem to describe gravity, but we, uh, we know have it the exists. opinion that it ought to. Yeah. And if it does, then it means that even space and time are randomly fluctuating and weird. <laughs> and so that was, it's like one of the great mysteries of science. Um, and we think there ought to be something there. Yeah. Um, scientists have been working at least 50, maybe 100 years trying to figure out how gravity and quantum mechanics go, should go together. Uh, the other thing, of course, is where did we come from? Uh, uh, and yes. if those spots weren't there, then we wouldn't be here. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And it even tells us um, through detailed analysis that uh, there is something called cosmic dark matter, which we can't see and perhaps never will see. Mm -hmm. So... We've got all these wonderful mysteries that are all embedded in this hot, this map of pink and blue blobs. Yes. And so it's totally fascinating and, and draws in thousands and thousands of scientists. Since the COBE satellite was flown, two more satellites were built and flown, and they confirmed our original measurements, which is nice because that meant we could get a Nobel Prize for discovering there the thing that turned out to be true. Congratulations. Uh, what if it weren't true? Then, of course, you don't get a prize. Um but now we have much, much, much more detail to go mm. on. Let's talk about that, right? So you were the senior project scientist on the James Webb Space Telescope, and I feel like that was the most recent exposure that the everyday person had to the frontier yeah. that, that we're now approaching. After the Hubble telescope was launched, uh, scientists said how wonderful it was. Yes. And by the way, we still can't tell how the galaxies grew. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was still one of the great mysteries of science because we thought we would understand. We thought, oh, now we know about the Big Bang and the hot and cold spots, and we should be able to simulate and calculate how galaxies would grow. And then we measured with the Hubble telescope, oh, we got it wrong. The uh, predictions had been that uh, galaxies would grow slowly, mm -hmm. so the Hubble would be able to see the first ones happening. And, of course, how do you see that? Well, you see back in time by looking at things that are far away. So you've got your own time machine in your eyeballs every morning, but you don't feel it. Yes. So um, look back in time, see what the universe is like when it was young, and see what were the galaxies doing. And they were already pretty grown up as far as back in time as the Hubble could see. So please build us another telescope to look farther back because we've got a big mystery here. Mm. So we still have a big mystery because we built the Webb telescope. It did what it was supposed to do. It produced beautiful pictures. And right away, we could see that the galaxies grew even faster than we thought. <laughs> uh, and so even though we had the information from Hubble and all the simulations and calculations we and predictions, we were still wrong. Mm. So uh, we're looking for something really deep and fundamental. So don't, want it, don't know what it is. So that's why astronomers are thrilled right now that they've got something to work on. Yes. Uh, it's going to take us a good long time, could be decades before we really, really deeply understand what were we wrong about. Mm -hmm. And it's even possible that there's some new force of nature or some thing that happened early on that's just so different that we can't even imagine it yet. All right, that is all for today's video. However, if you liked this video, we have a lot more where that came from. In fact, we just released a full length episode with this guest on the A16Z podcast. So if you'd like to hear it, go check it out in your favorite podcast app of choice, or we'll link it in the description below. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.